various big questions in which we have been trying to look at some of the questions and answers that are on the hearts and minds of Christians in our modern world. Uh, we have looked at questions like, is the Bible true? Uh, why do bad things happen to good people? Who goes where uh, when we die? And this morning, we attempt to answer the question, does God have a plan? And next week, we will enter into some uh, controversial territory as we talk about what uh, the Bible does and does not say about LGBTQ people uh, in our church and in our modern world. But that's next week. Put your rocks down. Uh, this morning, uh, we are talking about does God have a plan? We believe that God must have a plan. After all, we're not God, and we have lots of plans, right? Uh, we expect couples who are expecting a baby to have a birth plan. You need a, a career plan. Responsible adults need a retirement plan. Maybe you have a pension plan. You need a disaster preparedness plan. Plan, plan, plan. We even ask our kids if they have plans. What are your plans after high school? What are your plans after college? Please tell us you have a plan to repay your student loans because mom and dad aren't doing it. Uh, I think uh, a lot of that planning comes from a sense of responsibility within us and a desire to instill that same sense of responsibility in our children. We want things to go right, and that requires both a plan and a planner. We see this echoed in movie lines, you know, in the action movies, you know, you got a plan, time for plan B. Whose plan was this anyway? Plans allow us to prepare. Plans allow us to blame. When things go wrong, we go, this was your plan, not ours. And when we look at our lives, I think it's hard for us not to imagine God, the omnipotent creator of the universe, surely he has a plan, right? When you ask people about God's plan, uh, the verse we read today from Jeremiah is an all-time favorite. Uh, you've probably seen this posted all over the place. It's somebody loves, loves, loves this verse. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare, not for your harm, to give you a future with hope. Just sounds so good, sounds so nice. Put that quote in a nice font, a pretty picture, post that on Facebook, on Instagram. Needlepoint that bad boy, hang it up in your house. God's got a plan, and it's all good stuff for me. Yay, God! It's comforting, feels good. The struggle for modern readers of Scripture, though, is that we often read a verse like this out of context, without fully understanding that God has made a verse that may not be directly applicable to every person. It may not be for the modern reader. It may not be for you and me. Often when God is speaking to a person or people in Scripture, he's speaking to direct and specific circumstances. Not a universal promise for every Christian for here to eternity forever and ever. Amen. You know, that's the case with this particular verse of Scripture. The single line is actually lifted out of a much larger address to the Israelites during their time of exile in Babylon. After being conquered by ba the Babylonians, being conquered, uh, carted off to Babylon, the Israelites are suffering. This is a defining moment in biblical history. Biblical scholars often look at Old Testament scripture as pre-exilic or post-exilic. That's how important this time period was to the Jewish people. Everything in their history related to this time of exile and return. So God is speaking to a specific group of people at a specific time dealing with specific issues. And even in this pain, God's plans don't come to fruition for these people for another 70 years. When the Israelites are allowed to return to their homeland, roughly three generations of people have come and gone before these plans for welfare and not harm really come to fruition. You see, even when God makes a specific promise, there's not necessarily a time frame included. God seemingly is not in the hurry that you and I are in. We worship this God who thinks cosmically, generationally. You know, you look to the New Testament, you see the, the longing of the disciples and apostles that followed Jesus for him to return. They really expected it was going to happen in his lifetime. In their lifetimes, 
they would be shocked to see us sitting here 2,000 years removed from that event, still waiting, still wanting, still longing. Because the reality for all of us is when we think about the plans for our welfare, we would like for them to affect us, not our children, our grandchildren, our great, 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 great grandchildren. We'd like a little bit of that blessing and welfare for us, please. That longing for some sort of divine plan seems to come out of suffering and hardship. We want to understand. We want meaning in the midst of pain. We want there to be a reason for our suffering that somehow makes sense to us. When we think about just this last month alone, we remembered the 17th anniversary of September 11th. We witnessed the massive destruction of Hurricane Florence and the typhoon in the Philippines and China. When we see and experience things like this, it throws us. We want to understand, much like in that question we answered a few weeks back, why do bad things happen to good people? We want things to make sense. We want control. Or at the very least, we want God to be in control. We want something or someone to give this tragedy that we have experienced, the suffering that we are going through, meaning. One of the ways that we do this is by attributing both good and bad to God's plan. We drop this phrase all the time in Southern culture. It's everywhere in American Christianity. It's our go-to phrase when tragedy strikes. It's all just part of God's plan. Because we believe that God is sovereign. We believe in providence. God is the superintendent of the universe. He has all authority and rule over everything. King of the universe, author of creation. So if it happens in God's creation, it must be part of God's perfect plan for the world. Right? That sounds good. If everything is going exactly as you would like for it to go. If your life is all wine and roses, this sounds pretty good. But we often don't think about what the implications of it really means. If God's got an inclusive, perfect plan for the world, the question that strikes in my heart is, where does sin fit into this? If a script was written for your life and my life, if it's already been written, already been decided by God himself, no less, then what about all the decisions that we make that are clearly outside of God's will? You know, things like lying and infidelity and idolatry and coveting and gossip and abuse and murder and war. If those things exist as part of God's plan, that means that God is responsible for them. We see this in the world today as human beings, don't we? When a CEO of a company has to resign for something that happened under their watch, it may have been done by a person far removed from him, someone that he or she has never met, never seen, never experienced, but they did something under their watch, under the plan of the CEO, the person in charge, and someone has to pay the price, right? As the pastor of this church, I acknowledge that I am ultimately responsible for what happens in this community of faith. I take that very seriously. People in leadership are supposed to take responsibility for what happens under their leadership, under their plan. This is troubling when we look at God having a plan. In fact, it makes God kind of monstrous. Suddenly, if all of this is because God wrote a script a millennia ago, God's responsible for natural disasters and health woes and abuse and death and tragedy, your favorite football team losing, that person not getting an Emmy, and the fact that you stepped in gum in the parking lot on the way into church this morning, all of that's God's fault. So perhaps we need to reframe our thinking, and especially the way we talk about this. You know, lots of great thinkers throughout Christian, Christianity have, have tried to figure out what this all looks like. First, out of the Reformation, we have theologians like John Calvin who proposed theological determinism and predestination. This understanding God causes or controls everything. If something happens outside of God's will, then God's not God. It would invalidate God's dominion over creation. So everything from your wealth to your poverty, from your fertility to your health, all of that's under God's control. Every good idea you've ever had was sparked by God. Every poor decision that you've made was part of God's plan. 
no matter how much destruction or pain you may have caused. Not only that, but whether you are saved or damned has already been decided. Your eternal life is already in God's hands. The elect go to heaven, and if you're not in the club, I'm sorry. It's not going to go well for you. Here's my problem with predestination. You couldn't tell I have a little bit of a bias against it. Why does anything we do matter? If everything's already laid out, if I'm just an actor playing my part on this stage, why bother? Nothing you or I do really matters. Believe in God or don't. Love people or hate people. It creates this fatalistic attitude. It breeds indifference. If someone can't change, if someone can't respond to God, if they can't see the light, if they have no choice, no voice, no agency, no power, what's the point? And that doesn't seem to bear itself out in Scripture. You know, when Paul talks about life in Christ, the primary image he uses again and again is freedom. Freedom implies choice. Love requires choice. As the great Bonnie Raitt once sang to us, I can't make you love me. It's a choice. I mean, it's an easy choice. I'm pretty lovable, but you know, I, it's... Pause for laughter. One, two, three. Okay, good. All right. Another idea, apparently not as lovable as I thought, another idea that has become popular around the time of our nation's founding was an idea of deism. And this understanding, God created the universe, he set natural laws, he set it all spinning in motion, and then he steps away. Kind of like a, an absentee father. We wouldn't be here without him, but he doesn't have, want anything to do with us. God doesn't act in the world. But here's the problem with deism. I believe that God does work in the world. It's revealed in Scripture throughout the Old Testament. Jesus is evidence of it. I have seen it and experienced and felt it in this place among you, God's people. God works in this world. So what are we to believe about this idea of God having a plan predestination says God controls it all. Deism says he controls nothing. Well, as is often the case in United Methodism, we meet somewhere in the middle. We believe in something between those two extremes. Out of our Arminian tradition that our Methodist theology grows out of, we believe in free will, that we have choices, that we have agency, that we can follow God or turn away from God. Everything isn't written in stone. But throughout it all, God is with us. God is present in this world, guiding us, speaking to us, nudging us, dragging us, pushing us, pulling us toward the life that he would have us lead. As Adam Hamilton once wrote, God's will is more about how we make decisions rather than controlling the specific decisions we make. God is with us in this life striving to work with us, in us, and through those around us. But he lets us decide. He lets us make the choices of our lives, of how we are going to live. But in that understanding, we also believe that God does indeed have an ultimate plan for humanity. Because that's just another aspect of God revealed to us in Scripture. Scripture tells us again and again that God loves to spoil the ending. He loves to give us a little bit of a view of what the future holds. He tells the Israelites, you're going to get the promised land. It might take 40 years or so and a couple people passing away before you get there, but you're going to get it. Jesus tells the disciples again and again and again, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again on the third day. And they continue to say, we don't understand what you're talking about, Jesus. This doesn't make any sense until it happens. In Revelation and the prophets, we see the ultimate redemption of heaven and earth, the end of death and pain, a new heaven and a new earth. We know how the story ends. But the mystery is in how we get there. What impact we have on the lives we live. 
what impact we have in the lives of those around us? What will we do to make our community more reflective of the kingdom that God has established in heaven? Through it all, God is with us. I think the challenge for us in the modern world is to pay attention, to listen, to be still and know, to find a little quiet in the midst of all the noise and the chaos that surrounds us day to day, to listen for those guiding voices, that loving God that continues to guide and direct us and speak into our hearts and our lives, both directly and indirectly, through circumstance, through experience, and through the voices of some of these wonderful people that surround us, that in some way speak that wonderful divine truth into our hearts that we cannot deny and say, this, this is where I need to go. This is the decision that I need to make. The choice that was so hard now seems so easy. Or it seems difficult, but surely this is where God is calling me to go. I want to invite you.